Hello, this is Dr. Paul Cottrell, and I'm going to be talking about population curve and projections at the societal level and how that dovetails into what I've been saying in Gen Zero episode one through four. All right. So the video I'm going to be playing is going to be more focused on current projections of birth rates and declines of population bottlenecks in population, uh, aging population, with a little bit of, of uh, medical advancement. It doesn't consider what Kurzweil has been talking about in terms of these moments in time where you get this these quantum leaps of knowledge um, because of discovery, technological discovery. And I mentioned this in my episode one through four of Gen Zero. So it's important, you know, if you haven't seen those to, to watch them, but I go into detail the different groups based on age on how their ages will increase if they take advantage of some of the discoveries that will be happening in 2029 and 2045 and in 2100. There will be some people that are living today, not a lot, about 2,000, that will live beyond 120 years, all right, and most likely live beyond 150 years. And that if they can get to the next discovery gate with good health, they'll be able to extend that even more, all right? I know it sounds fanciful. I... I, it, it's it's not part of the normal trend of how humans uh, age in contemporary time um, or even post Noah time. But there is if you follow if you follow those four videos that I'm talking about that I did Gen Zero episode one through four, uh, you'll get an idea of why I say what I'm saying. That, that I don't want to go in, it, it's too, it, it'll take too long for me to reiterate what those videos are saying, but in a nutshell, in 2029, there's going to be a, dis, a huge discoveries in precision medicine in regards to having the body heal and extending life. Not where you're turning into bionic man. It's not transhumanism. It's just that allowing the body to heal and extending life. There are people that are aging slower already. You know, there's a lot of different biomarkers that people can look at. Um, some of them are the simple ones like the blood profile type stuff, genetic profile, methylization profile, telomere profile. There's lots of different ways to look at it, but people that are doing these anti-aging protocols, like what I'm doing. Um, some people are doing more advanced ones than I am, more expensive than what I'm doing. But there's a group of people, like myself, that are aging slower, all right? Some people started this early in their life, like I did. I started this in, when I was 16 years old with antioxidants. And other people did it later in life. Um, some people had chronic problems and then they were able to reverse them while they changed the, you know, went to this kind of anti-aging protocol. Some people didn't have really chronic problems. So there's a plethora of different people doing this. Lots of people are doing it, but there's about 2000 people in the United States that will live way beyond 120 years. And if they assuming you know they are there's no accident or anything like that but the trajectory of aging is different if you follow certain types of protocols now this is based on what humans have experimented with stacked found out how their body chemistry works with certain stacking of different vitamins and and and, and supplements right But the artificial intelligence 
and precision medicine, knowing your biomarkers and your, your telemetry when you go and you know get blood work or urine work or stool analysis or whatever, tissue and biopsy or whatever, the algorithm, the artificial intelligence algorithm will be able to customize a stack for you. What's out there in the market is based on experience and experimentation on different people and how they are changing their performance. They're getting better or they're getting worse. And, the, and it's been tweaked. Let me give you an example. So back in the 70s, you know, it was about taking vitamins, right? People started noticing that processed foods were making them unhealthy and, they, and there was a, a loss of nutrition. But then there was, and, and then an understanding of antioxidants through the 80s. The antioxidants understanding was also in the late 70s too, but, but you know, there was this increase in understanding within the population about antioxidants. And then, you know, probably this, the late 70s, don't hold me to this exactly, but probably in the late 70s, people were starting to get into the whole organic realm um, in terms of uh, produce. And you're going through the, the, that period of time, 70s and the 80s, and then there was more knowledge that was gained on what to eat, what types of vegetables are better for your body, either for gut biome or for skin or for cardiovascular, understanding a little bit more about Eastern medicine. Um, and then uh, realizing that certain medications uh, are in the Western world, in the allopathic medicine, could be harmful, obviously, because there's side effects, but also some in low doses can actually be anti-aging. So, and then finding an, an analog that's natural, that has a similar kind of uh, biological, biochemical process. So you can find an analog that is, that's natural. Not everything has an analog, but many do, many do. All right, and this is where the coupling of allopathic and Eastern medicine comes in and using what some of the benefits are to kind of slow down the aging process. Now, what is aging? You know, part of aging is the degeneration of neurons. Part of aging is osteoporosis or cardiovascular disease, arterial sclerosis, um, uh, a reduction in kidney, kidney function and excretion liver decline, function and decline. So when you understand that these organ systems can be treated and you slowly build up and improve the tissue, you're actually slowing down the aging process. There, there's this will not work with one mat. If someone says that there's a magic pill that will make you young, that's total bullshit. But they're stacking and understanding where your body chemistry is at at that moment in time. Because what to slow down and to, 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 to help slow down my aging process, because I've been doing this for so long, my stack is going to be a little bit different than someone that's just starting because they didn't cleanse, they, they didn't do cleanses, they didn't detoxify their body, you know, they're not used to, you know, certain types of foods, they have to change their gut biome, there's a lots of different things. So you just slowly do this. But the point here is, is that over time, this telemetry that we get from going to the doctor and getting blood work and biopsies and, and all this stuff, right? will be fed into an AI that will be able to customize longevity stacking to slow down your aging process. The key is to get to that point to be able to leverage. All right, so what is happening today with the about the 2000 people in the United States that are going to live to beyond 150, all right? Um, they have kind of customized their routine and it's not just supplementation. It's the way they eat, the way they sleep, how they train their, their body. And, you know, most of them don't overwork their body. 
Uh, it's about bringing down inflammation. It's about it's about strong antioxidants. It's it's uh, it's a, a balanced approach. All right, but this is based on experience. Like when when I talk about how I'm doing it, it's based on my experience going all the way back from when I was 16 years old and just doing those multivitamins and antioxidants. But things have advanced over time where new products have come to the market like NMN or understanding on how NR or resveratrol works or NAD plus work, understanding um, uh, you know, the importance of higher uh, potent antioxidants like C60 and how to use them. Um, understanding about recovery when working out, not overworking a muscle, not underworking a muscle, the importance of stretching and balancing, uh, the, un the importance of ex if you're exercise, if you start to atrophy with your muscles as you age, uh, don't you think you need to exercise your brain too? Because you're probably aging neurologically. And there's lots of different ways to do that. That's reading, writing, talking to people, learning new things, but also b doing balancing exercises stimulates your brain. You know, people would think, well, huh? I mean, I'm just, you know, learning about, well, no, you're actually stimulating your, your, cere your cerebellum. And not just that, the muscle coordination for the balance. So your, your cerebellum helps, to, helps you with the balance. Right. But the actual contraction of the different muscle groups for that balance is being um, activated in different areas of the brain, depending on if it's upper or lower muscle groups. So you're 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 activating and you're stimulating your brain. So this is the reason why intellectual exercise. Learning thing, new things but also balancing and light resistance training and, you know, some cardio, this is really important. And when you, when you figure out that perfect zone for you, because everyone has their different zone, you really are aging slower. You're, you're, you're healing. Now in 2029, there's going to be huge advancements in precision medicine and a huge advancements in being able to calculate through all this telemetry from your checkups and being able to customize a program for you, all right? Now, the ones that have been on this journey are gonna benefit already, are gonna benefit more than ones that are not, that, that haven't started. But that doesn't mean that you can't benefit from the, these technologies that will be coming out, these understandings that will be coming out in 2029. You're also seeing, we're in, we're in 2024 right now. You're almost daily, there is a new huge discovery that's being published that is moving the ball forward and understanding these cellular processes of aging and how to mitigate certain, certain types of diseases. So it's not out of the realm of possibility in five years seeing this big jump. It's like quantum jump, right? The probability is getting more. It's even possible that it happens in 2027, like what Elon Musk is saying. But I'm sticking with what Kurzweil said in for the 2029 AI meeting human intelligence. So, but there's going to be huge advancements in artificial, uh, huge advancements in artificial intelligence applied to medicine, applied to precision medicine for you, and how you how you can manage the longevity better. And it's based on these different routines that, you know, over two thousand people have been doing, but about two thousand people are really going to benefit from that huge. Um, live to 100 more than 150 year kind of jump you know 120 is is given you know it's the question is, is do they jump through past 100 150 i think they do so just go to that those videos gen zero one through four and you'll be able to understand my the, why i'm saying this all right, i go into detail why all right and it 
there's a hint of it in the in the Bible, and and if you graph out the ages of these people that are written in the Bible, you'll understand why I'm I'm saying what I'm saying. Now, um, now in 2045, there'll be this kind of this singularity between AI and human, where there's kind of like the super this this uh, this merger of the two. There's going to be another big jump. It's what I call AI plus plus in medicine. Now there's going to be there's going to be people that go towards transhumanism for that, and there's going to be other people that will be humanists. You'll be able to benefit from this even if you're a humanist. And then in in 2100, there's another predicted jump in 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 discovery what I call AI plus plus. And uh, that further, it furthers it out. But uh, if I'm right, then moving towards lifespans that were pre NOAA are possible. But you have to get to these different gates in AI to be able to benefit from this technology. So that's, that's my take on it. The video I'm gonna be playing is not considering Kurzweil's quantum jumps because of artificial intelligence discovery in in medicine. All right, I think it's going to happen. I I really think that this is going to happen. All right, and you can benefit from people like myself on how what we have done to try to slow down the aging process. There's lots of people out there, and, and, and you know, but not many of them started at age 16. I'm very few, all right, maybe five, but, but, you know, but, uh, there's something to be learned from the people, people like myself, where you can slow down the aging process by st so the, the whole idea is stacking. See, a lot of people, they'll, they'll say, oh, this doesn't work because we did the study and it didn't, didn't, you know, we used uh, vitamin D3 or whatever, and it didn't slow down it, you know, this, whatever. Well, you're you're not stacking. It's 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 all about stacking. Your body works in in positive feedback loops, negative feedback loops. It has thousands or tens of thousands of chemicals that are all interacting in a cell at the same time. There is no way that you're going to be able to just get. Um, you know, the real longevity benefits by just taking one thing. You're going to see some benefit, but you're not going to get that quantum benefit that everyone is talking about in terms of getting your immune system back to its highest level and healing the body and, and reversing some of the aging, the normal aging damage. Um, that most people experience. It's about stacking. I can't say it enough. It's about stacking. All right. If someone says, oh, just take, you know, just one thing or just two things, no, you don't, they don't really understand biochemistry. So just pay attention. People, you you'll be you'll be able to benefit from the experience of individuals like myself that have been doing this for decades, all right? There are some people that have been doing it just for five years and they're seeing huge benefits, but they're also benefiting from, you know, some of the advances, you know, back in the seventies and the eighties, back in the eighties, there was an NMN. There wasn't a real understanding of NAC and how it works with the body or NAD plus and how it works with the body or how resveratrol really works with the body. The understanding wasn't as, as good in the 80s. And as the decades progressed, medical understanding and biochemistry understanding of, of supplementation and coupling it with all these other things like exercise, what types of exercises, the duration of the exercise, the heart rate and the zone that you need to be in for the exercise, how to improve, improve your 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 PFT, your pulmonary functional test. 
we have a lot more understanding now. So the people that are just starting are going to be able to kind of, you know, benefit from all this experimentation that was going on in the last 30 years. But we're, you can kind of see this is moving forward, okay? So with that said, there's going to be this battle, and I got to do a video about this, but there'll be this battle between the transhumanists and because there's going to be there's going to be tension in the society because artificial intelligence is going to start changing economics into a theory that we don't have yet. All right, we have this idea, rightfully so, based on the epoch we're in, of capital and labor. You invest in capital, labor provides services or, or manufa manufacturing of goods, and there is a symbiotic relationship between the investor and the labor and the society grows. Perfect example, Ford makes the Model T, hires a bunch of people, is much more productive because of the assembly line using these different methods, and people can earn money to buy the product they're making. With artificial intelligence, it's very possible that in many industries, maybe all industries, there's gonna be decoupling of labor and capital. And there will be winners and losers in the short term, and there may be dystopia in the back end of the timeline. The way, and there's, the economic theory isn't developed, so we don't really know, but I believe that artificial intelligence will decouple labor and capital. And what that means, we don't really know. But it's going to put people in fear. Now, keep in mind, there's going to be a population reduction, right, just naturally because of birth rates in developed countries have declined. But there's going to be this decoupling of labor and capital and you have a lot of debt that has grown in these countries on a personal level and on at a countrywide level how is that debt serviced through taxes through people doing things in the economy and funds are generated to be back to the, the government to pay the debt all right or at a personal level, you have to uh, work, get money, and pay your debt. All right, it's very sim very similar. But when you have less workers, then you're not able to service the debt, and you can't just have AI just make a bunch of products because the people aren't going to be able to buy it. So something is not right. There's going to be if AI takes all jobs away in this mind experiment that we're, we're talking about here, then there is this the ultimate decoupling of cap, capital and labor and no one wins because no one can buy anything because no one's employed. At the very beginning, ones that implement artificial intelligence in let's say their workforce and their competitors not, they can produce a service or a product quicker, cheaper than their competitor and they may win the market, but it spirals down. Then the competitor either goes out of business or does the same thing and less and less people are employed. And then eventually it hits a certain crescendo where you have no one buying and then all the companies go out of business. That's the ultimate of how this AI could totally radically change um, economies because of this decoupling of labor and capital. But there may be something else that, that may develop where there's some sort of symbiotic relationship between humans and this artificial intelligence and not completely destroy labor and capital and, and world economies. We just, we're moving into an era that we have no theory for. No, that I have not heard anyone's theory that is adequate to, to describe this 
it seemingly um, eventuality with the decoupling of labor and capital. Now, when this is happening, as this AI starts to inch its way through the economy and take people's jobs away, and you start to see kind of like the haves and the have, there's gonna be people that have benefited the early, the early stage and then the ones that are not, but then eventually even the ones that were benefiting will start to be shed because the AI will be able to build an AI. The AI won't need humans. That's the danger here. So there's going to be strife. There's going to be conflict and it's not going to be peaceful. There's going to be social unrest. And you're going to be the ones that are benefiting are going to be more transhumanist type while the ones that are not benefiting are typically humanists. So as we move through from 2024 to let's say even 2029, people are gonna, you're gonna start hearing more and more people being anti-AI or anti-transhumanist. And as that's happening, uh, it starts to build up. More and more people are losing their job. They see the, the existential threat of humanity through the singularity in 2045. And there's this kind of this merger between artificial intelligence and human intelligence. And this is where the takeoff for transhumanism takes place. But there's still going to be lots of people that either want to be transhumanist but can't afford it, can't get into that, or they don't want to be transhumanist and they just stay humanist. But there's going to be this fracturing of society. And there's, I predict that there's going to be a huge blackout in 2054. Now, I need to do a video on why I say 2054, and it's really spooky because it deals with the Beatles and the Beatles rock band, all right? It's kind of spooky, but if I'm right, uh, it's sometimes when there's a recording of a present event as of the recording, and then it's shelved, and you replay it in the future, you start to see that what this person is saying is telling you the future. But they don't realize it because they're, they're, they are tapping into something that is more Akashi record-ish kind of, but they don't realize it. But it's only through hindsight you go, I can't believe what they just said. All right, this matches. Now, some people would say, well, that maybe that's representational bias or whatever. But if you pay attention to what's going on with this decoupling of capital and labor and even the tensions that you just are, are seeing that are building up in society, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that there is a, a war. There is going to be conflict between the transhumanists and what I call the humanists or the monks. And these monks are going to shut the grid down. Now, at the same time, this is all happening. AI in 2029 is doing medical advancements for longevity. So people that plug into that will be able to live longer. And in 2045, the same thing. So there's population reduction, just in the, assuming nothing is extended because of precision medicine and AI and all this. Let's just assume that doesn't happen. There's gonna be a reduction in population just with the normal trajectory. And that's what this video that I'm gonna be playing is gonna show. But if you add in this idea of people, there are gonna be groups of people, not a lot, there's gonna be groups of people that will be able to move into the 150 plus zone. And some people that were, let's say in the 80 year zone for law, for life expectancy moves more into the 120 then this because of AI advancement this projection of decline in the population will slow down but it doesn't mean that new births will happen the birth rates are are declining because of economic problems so we're going to see people that are benefiting from some of this longevity technology in 20, 
29 and in 2045, birth rates most likely will stay lower, not because of aging uh, ovaries, because I think the artificial intelligence is actually going to be able to slow down ovulation, um, understanding how to slow down the ovulation of a woman um, instead of just you know, losing eggs. So the ability to have a healthy child beyond age 40, I think will happen. It's not there yet, but you know, it will happen in mass. And again, in the Bible, it said that many of these, you know, like Sarah, she was very old when she had a child, right? So yeah, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Same thing with, you know, uh, Noah. Um, in, in Noah's time and in, even in, in Adam's time. So there, there are hints of this capability of having children healthy at a very old age. And it's not just because they're male, it's also the female was older. So, but I think AI's advancements in that will move us in that direction. The point here is just that populations are declining because of birth rates are declining. Why are they declining? A big part of it is economics. So the stress between 2045, this AI decoupling is still going to be there and probably birth rates will decline even more. But a portion of the population will live much longer. And a portion of that will also be able to be childbearing. So they're not mutually exclusive, but you got to just kind of think that, okay, you got population reduction. People are dying off. The, the birth rates are lower because of economics, but then you have artificial intelligence discoveries in medicine that if people plug into, people use, people take the advice of the AI, that they'll be able to live longer. They might be able to procreate longer into their, into their life cycle. But the economic problem is still there and birth rates will still continue to decline. So you, as the birth rates are still declining, people that are not benefiting from this artificial intelligence longevity will start to die off. The ones that are benefiting from it are still hanging on. So the the trajectory down may be less than what is predicted here. But the decline of the population may be happening. Now, when the strife between, in, be, between the labor and capital, this problem with labor and capital, that strife in society, ends up where the monks shut down the power grid for the transhumanists, there's going to be massive die-off. So you're going to have a big part of the population that will die off because of this blackout war between the monks and the transhumanists. All right. Now, a lot of people are going to say, huh? But, uh, it, well, most of our ability to live a modern life is because of technology. Now, a follower did mention in, in a comment that was an interesting comment. And he goes, well, what about zero point in energy? So kind of free energy, right? But you can still have free energy, right? But the thing is, is that the monks will start to realize that the Achilles heel of the AI is crunching data and to crunch the data. And because they're mechanical, right? You know, that to crunch the data They need energy. And whatever energy source they use, zero point energy, electromagnetic energy, solar, nuclear, whatever it is, that's the Achilles heel. The monks will find a way to knock that out. And when that happens, the artificial intelligence starts to go down in power. They, they, the ability for them to win the, this blackout war, this 2054 war, their chances diminish. 
because you're attacking their Achilles heel. Now, I think that also the, the, the one that made the comment uh, didn't, you know, I think they're also meaning you can use zero point energy even for the monks and therefore maybe the population won't, won't go uh, down as far because if you lose the power, most of society will die off like more than 70%, maybe even 90% of the population of the world. So we're, there's going to be this huge reduction. So here, this video is saying slower reduction. I'm saying that it might actually be um, even slower of a reduction because of longevity discovery in AI, but then a huge decline really quick because of the 2054 blackout war. This person, I think if I interpret their comment, because it was very short, if you use zero point energy, if you find energy sources that are easy and that are decentralized, it doesn't matter if it's zero point or not, right? But if you can utilize those energies um, and it's decentralized, then you may not have a huge decline in the, the monk population and or these humanist population that might be true but i don't see a major rollout of decentralized quote zero point energy being used at a mass scale around the world with you know with seven billion people by 2054 I mean, 2054 is not, it's, it's, it's only 30 years away. I don't see it happening. So I'm not sure that it, it scales up fast enough. I mean, we're having a problem scaling up just charging electric vehicles. So I still think at this moment in time, as I'm thinking through this, I still think that the blackout in 2054 is going to be a huge population reduction. But if zero point energy can be done in mass and in scale quickly by 2054, then I would say that the population reduction would be less. But I just don't see that scaling up now, uh, yeah, that ability. And it's amazing what people can do with magnets and, and you know, certain configurations that just literally, um, using magnetism sets in motion a, a, a perpetual motion machine, right? Uh, some people use this as zero point energy. Maybe it's not, maybe it is, I, I don't really care, right? But the thing is, is that the point is, is that there are methods, but I just, just because there's a method and there, there's a physics of it, doesn't mean that it rolls out as a usable technology or scalable te te technology by 2054, when this the, this decoupling and all the all these problems in society between the transhumanists and the humanists happen, transhumanism is slowly happening now, but it's really going to take it, it's really going to accelerate in 2045, and and then nine years in from 2045, then you got this. There, there's a lot of strife that's that's going to be happening with the society. And that's when the humanists or the, the, the monks have to cut the cord and kill off the energy source, even though they know that humans will die in the process. But to save humanity, it has to happen to be able to kill off this transhumanist connection because their Achilles heel is energy. Now, is it possible that the art that that these transhumanists know that their energy source is their Achilles heel and they scale out zero point energy. Maybe, maybe I just it's possible. There's a lot of possibilities, but is it probable? I don't know. I I would think not. But um this is kind of like the thinking I have. So you gotta think you gotta remember that there is this the normal trajectory of population reduction because of lack of birth rates and just people living to about 80, maybe even 90. Um, 
and then you may be able to slow down the population decline with artificial intelligence and longevity algorithms. And then there's another huge reduction in the population because of the blackout in 2054. That's the thesis, okay? So before I, before I um, play the video, please make sure that you subscribe to all my videos, or, uh, all my channels. I have thousands and thousands of videos all right, out there that are free. Please subscribe. I have seven channels. I have four channels on YouTube. I have Brighton, BitChute, and Rumble. I have Patreon, so you can be a paid member on my Patreon channel to help support my work. You can help support my work also by donating. You can donate through Stripe, PayPal, or buy me a coffee. Those links are on my website on the homepage, so you can go to the-studio-reykjavik.com. Click those links on the homepage and donate if you would like to help support my work. I do a lot of really interesting kind of unique ideas, all right? So please help support my work. In addition, please share the links of my work and ask your social media to follow me, all right? There is going to be, in a, there are gonna be a series of events that, that take place that you're gonna to need to hear unique, unvarnished, perspectives right and the more people that i can reach the more people i can help and it's up to you now i know what my game plan is and i'm trying to help people now if you know they don't want to listen that's their choice but i'm giving you the survival plan right so um please follow my videos and you know, ask your social media to, to, to follow my, my channel. Also, please go to my store, the-studio-reykvik.com and get the supplements that I offer and follow my advice about how to use them. You want to build a base for your body to be able to benefit from these new discoveries that are going to happen that are gonna be precision for you. All right. It's all over the place now, anti-aging longevity, and it's not just a fad. Trust me on this. It's not a fad. There's real science to this. All right. And, it, you know, once they can, they can read through the publications and they're going to go, oh, wow, Dr. Paul Cottrell was right. Yeah. You know, and this is, you know, and I accidentally fell into this when I was 16 because of the heart disease issues that were in my family. On my mother's side so you know you know so uh, i just and that was just the the accidental falling into this but um i've learned a lot about how this works all right so just take my take my advice all right and and customize it for yourself because your biochemistry is going to be slightly different but um with that said please go to my store the-studio-reykjavik.com some of the products that I have before I start the video, I know this is a long monologue, I apologize, but you know, to help support, you know, to help reach people, I have to keep on telling people what to take. So um, structural nano silver liquid, very important to neutralize pathogens. If you neutralize pathogens on a regular basis, you don't get sick as often. When you don't get sick as often, you're not as inflamed as often. And guess what? If someone gets a cold, let's just say you get a cold, all right? It, let's say, takes a week to get rid of the cold. But you, you know, let's say you had coughing and congestion, right? And it was affecting your lungs. It takes a good 30 days after the cold goes away for your cells to regenerate and and get through get through all that inflammation that was building up throughout that week 30 days so literally for five weeks your body is going through trauma because of that cold now many people get a cold twice a year some people because they're not healthy more let's say you say it's twice a year that's 10 weeks out of the year where your body is healing 
going through and healing after a cold. That's one fifth of your of your year. A little bit off on the ratio because it's 52 weeks, but but you see the point that I'm making. About one fifth of your year is healing from two cold events in your for that year. So it you got to keep this in mind that if you reduce the that in, inflammatory that chronic inflammatory response and the chances of it ramping up, you're actually healing the body just by doing that and not doing all the other stuff. Now do you understand why I keep on saying it's all about neutralizing pathogens, bringing down inflammation and and neutralizing free radicals because when you're all inflamed and you're sick and all that, you're producing lots of free radicals. Once again, if you just pay attention to what I'm saying, you are gonna benefit. So neutralizing pathogens on a regular basis is really important, not just to prevent you from catching, let's say a cold or some sort of, you know, some sort of infection, but it's preventing you from having to remodel the damaged tissue that takes weeks to do. So what you wanna do is you take a teaspoon of this structural nano silver liquid, you, you, you gargle with it, you, you swish it in your mouth, maybe around 20 seconds or so, and then you swallow, all right? And that will keep the mucosal barrier good and it'll neutralize pathogens. I have it in a 14 parts per million, which is the max 14, I have the max 35, which is 35 parts per million. And I also have the structural nano silver solution in uh, 30 parts per million. Okay. All at different price points because some people can't afford, you know, some of the, the other, the higher parts per million, but take a teaspoon of a day. If you're not feeling well, take a tablespoon or two a day. I have these applicator sets. So you can put the liquid in the nasal spray or a dropper or a spritzer and carry it with you in a bag instead of carrying a big bottle with you to work or whatever. All right. So go and get the applicators if, it, if you haven't already. It's a great way to, to transport it. In addition, I have structural nano silver drops and lozenges. So if if you, if you get allergies or you're trying to prevent uh, getting sick during the cold season, get a couple bags of this for your household. But I have it in honey and lemon drops. It's 100 count. I also have it 100 count in blueberry drops. All right. And in zinc, zinc elderberry. So and this is in a 21 count because they're larger. But get a couple bags of this for your household. Because the moment you start feeling a little sensation, a little tick, you know, a little that little feel of an irritation, you want to take it right away. And why? Why do you want to do that? I apologize for the noise, but but the the um, it's aggravating. Okay, so uh, the moment you start feeling that that irritation, you build up those secretions, and you're you're neutralizing that antigen or that pathogen. All right. During the allergy season, you're breathing in, let's say, pollen or whatever, um, and that activates a, a hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity type one reaction. Well, that means that lots of histamine is being produced, mast cells are producing cytokines, and oh, by the way, you start to get inflamed. You get these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Well, it take even though it, you know the allergy may go away after you know after a couple hours or whatever. It's still those those cytokines are have already created tissue damage that has to heal. Now that that that's a, a lot of those cells are go into tep temporary necrosis and they can heal. But the point is is that you are if you are chronically having allergies. Then you start getting all these different types of pathologies in your lung. But if you mitigated the antigen that's coming in during the allergy season, AKA taking drops and lozenges, you're reducing the chances of that. 
and reducing the chances of, of, of chronic inflammation. Now, do you understand the power of what I've been saying? And I've been saying this for four years. So go to the store, the-studio-reikovic.com and get the drops and lozenges. The moment you start feeling that, that irritation, take it right away. You want to neutralize the pathogen and, and, and uh, build up the secretions to prevent that, that allergic reaction. All right. And it, and it helps those secretions will help that maintain that mucosal barrier to prevent pathogens from entering your system and getting you sick. That's how it works. Take my advice. I do this. I take structural nail silver liquid, a teaspoon a day. All right. Now let's finally get to the video. I apologize for the long monologue, but you know, sometimes, you know, it's frustrating to try to explain these larger concepts that a lot of people don't understand. All right, here we go. So this is a population count. This is gonna be a population reduction video here based on birth rates and you know what current life expectancy not in, it's not really including this artificial intelligence longevity quantum leap in long in, in, in life expectancy it's not including that the population collapse is already here all of the globalized connections and assumptions that create the world we know we are at the end of it and the u.s birth rates have fallen to record children born per hour women in the uk it's even lower at under 1.5 children it's not just an ice stated problem for the west either across the world developed countries are falling apart under the weight of their own aging populations as fewer and fewer children are born the millions of people entering retirement puts even more pressure on the rest of the country and it seems the western world is in for an incoming population crisis so what happens when the population eventually collapses and how did this situation ever get so out of control why are people like Elon Musk desperately panicking about the collapse of population? We have no idea how fast the population is going to collapse. You know, basically, civilization will die with a one for an adult bathroom. Well, let's take a peek at what lies ahead for the Western world's future when the population becomes old and countries start shrinking up. Now, lots of people might welcome the idea of a natural population decline at first. Anyone who's ever been stuck in traffic can understand why it might be nice if there were a lot less people. It seemed at one point that there were so many people, all these professors saying that there were too many people on planet Earth, that we were going to extract all the resources from the planet, that humans were a cancer on Earth. Cause $10 can help fund powerful ads. No, 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 $10 Sorry. can help open field offices. The humans were a cancer on Earth, causing the world's natural ecosystems to die. We have lots of environmental problems that currently exist that are being made worse by having lots and lots of people engaging in them. Uh, first, we've got population. Uh, the world today has 6.8 billion people. That's headed up to about 9 billion. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, healthcare, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. There were people everywhere saying they don't want to have children because there's already too many humans in the world. All this made sense when it was important for us to procreate for our survival. But now, for our survival, we have to not procreate. And we have to change and rewire our biology and our culture. But it turned out in just a few years that this was all completely nonsense. And instead of having the world population continue to grow at a rate we can't control, it's going to be the opposite situation, a population crash. And you see, a population decline isn't so dangerous because of the end result. It's the journey countries have to take to get there. And this journey is truly horrifying and something that world leaders need to pay more attention to. This is a population pyramid, a chart which shows the amount of the population which makes up each age bracket. To most of human history, pretty much every single country has looked like this. At the bottom, we have all the kids, making up a large proportion of the total people. In this chart, which shows the US in 1963, nearly 11% of the total population are four years old or younger. This is the baby boom generation. 
or the people having babies after the war during the 1960s hippie craze. But as time goes on, some of these people die and their proportion naturally declines. The middle shows all the people of working age, and without enough people here to support the people at the beginning and ends of their lives, society starts to break down. This rough template for a healthy society has worked silently in the background for centuries. It's the natural order of things. But only now, for the first time in modern history, are we starting to see this golden rule broken on a global scale? Here's what the US looked like in 2023. Instead of a large population of kids waiting to replace the adults as they got older, the opposite is actually true. Even though child mortality has fallen drastically, 50 years of falling birth rates have done their damage, and there are now far more middle-aged and elderly people than children. Which begs the question everybody is starting to wonder, what will this chart look like in another 20 years? While we can pretty accurately predict the shape of that chart, the reality we're all going to be living in will be a lot more shocking. Aging populations and population decline present a massive problem for societies, and we don't even need to imagine what these problems will be, as we can already see it today. This chart shows the population period for South Korea today. Here, the bulge in the middle is even more pronounced, with just 3% of the population made up by babies and toddlers. Now the largest group is 50 to 54 year olds, people who are getting closer and closer to retirement. Over the next two decades, the majority of the South Korean population will stop working leaving the few children left to bear the burden for the rest of their lives. So what's actually causing this? And in the digital age where our personal information feels more like public property, it's alarming to see just how accessible our data is to predators and data brokers. That's why I want to tell you about our video sponsor, Aura. You see, data brokers sell your information to anyone interested, scams, spammers, you name it. Your full name, email, home address, health records, and even details about your relatives or fraud alerts from credit bureaus. Well, Aura does all of this for me. Forward slash moon. Link in the description to start your two week free trial today. And what effect is it having on people's lives today? While there's a few different causes that we're going to explore, the South Korean work culture is a huge factor. There, the grind starts early and it's hard. South Korean students study the most in the world. As per usual, when compared to other countries, they follow the 996 structure from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days of the week. Officially, it ends around 3 to 5, getting longer as the kids get older. But officially, is the key word here. The academic pressures and expectations of kids are so high that just going to school isn't nearly enough. Instead of finding out what they want to do, kids are thrown into a hyper-competitive grind, which they'll be locked into until they retire. After school, most students are nearly done with study. In fact, some aren't even halfway through the day. Instead, their next destination is called Have One, otherwise known as a cram school. Here, students attend private sessions where they go over what they just studied and memorize as much of it as possible. It's a multi billion you're dollar. seeing this in the United States. You're seeing this kind of situation in the United States also, um, especially with upper middle class socioeconomic families. They'll put their kid into a boarding school. Sometimes it's a a uh, private school where uh, the student will live there and sometimes they come home. But these are very high pressured environments because these private schools are feeder schools to the top schools in the country, you know, the Ivy League and even the Ivy League plus schools. So, um, so there's there's this what I've been noticing with with kids these days is that there's more pressure than you saw in the 70s or in the 80s in terms of just getting into a good school and you add in the test prep industry that is feeding this this pressure and these children are cracking they're and they're cracking for different reasons one is, is that it's too much of a grind. Two, they don't have any time to actually think um, or to have friends or to play outside. Everything is structured. Today, with these types, these types of kids, yeah, there are some people that are exercising outside, but it's in a very structured format. They're on a baseball team or they're on a, a tennis team or they're doing swimming lessons or they're, you know, doing bi violin lessons or whatever, right? They have just so much extracurricular activity on top of their test prep. And this is really ramped up during the high school years to get into a good school. 
my observation, since I have have many degrees, my observation is, is that individuals in the 70s and the 80s, even the, the boomer generation, we had more time as kids to be kids. And when you have more time to be a kid, have more time to dream, have more time to have friends, have more time to experience the, the, the earth, the outdoors, in not a structured manner, you're going to have people that are more creative. I find that this new crop of, 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 of um, students and this new generation that's gone through this heavily test prep, high structured schooling, they're not as creative. They may, I notice that they think fast, but thinking fast doesn't mean better ideas. And not just that, there's a lesson to be learned on what the, um, the presidents were saying on their schedule. If you look at FDR, now he was going through a world war. If you look at, and this is archival information, you look at FDR's schedule in the White House versus let's say a modern day president's schedule, doesn't matter who it is, George Bush, Clinton, Barack Obama, Trump, Biden may be a different case because of his dementia, but, but you know, in the, back a long time ago, presidents had more time to think instead of having to go to another meeting or do a rally or do that, you know, that they, it was, it wasn't as structured back in FDR's day. Fast forward to a modern day president and everything's structured. And so now presidents can't really have the time to really digest the issue. Presidents have to lean more on their advisors. They become more fishbowled. They get pushed around by deep staters. We need to take a lesson from this. And that is don't over calendar your activities. Make sure that you have time to think. You need downtime. And this applies not just to adults, but also to, to kids. These high pressured environments in the long run, even if they get to a good school, is not worth it. It's not worth it. Because what happens is, is they're not as creative. And there's, there, there's, um, there's uh, sometimes psychological problems that may happen, especially if they don't get what they were looking for, what they were, their big goal was. You know, you, you, you see it in, you know, the professional schools too. You know, it's really high pressure, right? It's just not worth it. But that's a Gen Xer looking at this change in education and test prep and all this, it, the pressure is too much and kids are cracking. So by the time they get to the school and they get, a, they get into the good school, they really weren't a kid. They've just, it, uh, just been studying their whole life. Their body isn't, you know, the ones that are really studious, uh, their body isn't in, in, in good shape, right? Um, there are student athletes that are that fall in a better situation than that but uh many of the students are not student athletes so their body isn't isn't as healthy they're sleep deprived so they're not as healthy there and so they get to this the good school and maybe they get good grades and they get to their they they get to the workforce and maybe they don't get their their job that they were looking for and so they get all depressed or maybe even they get their job and they realize it's nothing but a grind. Case in point, what is the quote dream thing to do in the United States, which is stupid. Trust me, it's stupid. All right. The dream thing, this is the trajectory of these kids. They come out of the womb and the mother and the father want them to go to Harvard or Yale. 
All right. So they have money and they, they do all this uh, uh, private schooling and, you know, and tutors and the student is, um, you know, doing all the extracurriculars. They're getting good grades and they get into Harvard or Yale. All right. And then they're doing well. They're, they're studious and, you know, they have good grades there, too. And their family wants them to be a banker, right? Get into finance or be a VC or get into private equity because that's where all the money is, all right? And they don't realize that, you know what? There are tens of thousands of other people that already have experience in the VC world or the PE world where they don't need these youngins other than analysts that do grunt work and you apply ai now to it where you don't even need the analysts the ai will do the the the, the analytical if you you know design it correctly with these spreadsheets and models and you know just get the information the telemetry and then just automatically populate all right you don't need as many of these hard working you know Ivy League, IB wannabes, investment bank wannabes. So they get all stressed and they get all worried and they get all, they go, what's the, what's the point? And then they, they need to start realizing that, well, you know what? It wasn't worth it. You should have lived, not just go for a certain goal. And so this stress, and I've seen, I've seen this over time, you know, because I've seen these different generations come through school. It's a problem. It's a big problem. So they get all stressed out. They don't like their job. They didn't build social, a, a, a big enough social network. Maybe they're a little intimidated with social settings. And so they postpone family creation and it just spirals down from there it just spirals down from there so i just people need to pay attention that the stress on the kids these days to perform well in school has gotten to the point where it is a health crisis more people need to talk about that in the country, with nearly 80% of kids in attendance, there are 24,000 of them in the capital school, three times the number of convenience stores. Low-income families desperate to get out of the grind stake all their savings on their kids, and on average end up paying more in school fees than on food. But with everyone else doing the same thing, their odds of success are slim to none. Kids need to have one late in the evening, and in some cases as late as 11 p.m. All of this is just to prepare the kids for the national exam, where all of the students look to snag the limited spots at university. Just one day before the attempted assassination of President Trump, I gave a speech in Las Vegas calling for a unity government. I think most Democrats and Republicans know deep down that this is toxic polarization. Other students looking to snag the limited spots at university compete for the privilege. It's a make or break moment for these kids and their families. Their whole life up until this point is leading up to this. Success can mean the start of a high paying career and the illusion of escape from the drudgery. Failure leads to shame, family rejection, regrets, and the crushing feeling that you've wasted your family's hopes and dreams. That you have zero future ever ahead of you. It's not hard to see that this system is clearly dystopian and horrible. It's one of the most depressing ways to live your childhood. The stress and the pressure can easily push kids over the edge. It's no surprise the South Korean teenagers are some of the unhappiest in the world. But even after their 3D education system, all they've done is take off the train wheels. The work culture and what it demands of people in South Korea is even worse. Just like in school, the hours are long and drawn out. Despite the country's supposed 52-hour cap on working hours, people regularly report working much longer shifts, often 12 hours a day with extra work on the weekends. It's the worst for people working towards the top or at the bottom. If you're a high-powered office worker or you're working for a large company, things are going to get competitive. Part of the purpose of the insane grind for the exam is to pick out and indoctrinate the kids who can maintain these inhuman levels of work.
많은 사람들이 중요하게 생각하는 시험 중에 하나입니다. 평면적으로 부산에 대해서 하루에 몇 시간씩 공부를 하셨나요? 평면적으로 부산이 된 후에는 거의 여덟 시간씩 공부를 해야 이제 점수 성적이 잘 나올 수 있는데요. 저 같은 경우는 여덟 시간에서 조금 덜 The competition and the hours that people get used to at the cram schools carries over to the workplace. It still hasn't been enough, though. In 2023, the South Korean government even considered raising the cap from 52 hours to 69 every week. Ironically, the measure was proposed in part to double down on the crisis that they're currently facing with fertility rates. Because they didn't have enough workers, companies wanted to work the ones they did have extra hard. It was only beaten back by a massive response from young people already sick of this toxic culture. At the bottom of the ladder, though, it's even worse. Rather than working highly demanding jobs on a psychological level, so-called unskilled workers in Korea have to sacrifice their physical health as well. Now, we've all had the horror stories about Amazon, like workers relieving themselves in bottles because they don't have enough time for anything else. Amazon drivers now suing the retail giant, claiming they're forced to urinate in water bottles in order to keep up with the delivery schedule that the company sets. That's what's going on in the West, where labor laws and culture are admittedly much better. Career, on the other hand, is some of the worst. Everybody gets worked to the bone. Some workers have gotten used to the white patches they get in their uniforms after a long day. Hours and hours of running for deliveries or moving boxes in the warehouse takes its toll and eventually, soul deposits build up from their bodies getting pushed to the brink. I mean, according to official figures, 500 die each year from overworking in South Korea, as their bodies simply give up under the pressure of survival. The real number, though, is likely to be much higher. Truly understanding the effects of population collapse is hard for people today. We're so disconnected from what effects this has, and our society has changed so much since the last time this happened, that it's impossible for society to remember. At first, you might think that we've seen similar things in the early 20th century. The combination of two world wars along with the Spanish flu, which disproportionately affected the young and healthy, decimated the young populations of Europe. After the crisis had ended, countries were deprived of millions of sons and daughters. In the short term, the consequences of this were brutal. Even after the war ended, millions more would perish from famine and disease. But because over the next few decades, more kids were being born than being lost, Western countries recovered relatively quickly from the change in demographics. Instead, you have to go all the way back to the 1300s and the Black Death to see a time when the population truly shrank. Now, the estimates vary, but it's generally agreed that around 50 million people died over the course of a couple of decades. Almost half of those deaths happened in Europe with the population being cut by around a third in total. With so much of a time gap, we look back and see the effects of the plague on the next 100 years generally positive. The depletion of the working population meant that the demand for labor went up. Workers had better bargaining position and over time, practices like serfdom disappeared in Western Europe, whilst living standards rose. Peasants had more money and food because there was less competition. But that was only after 100 years. Looking at the end result fails to see the harrowing journey it took to get there. Entire towns and villages were abandoned, sometimes forever. Food shortages and famine were rampant because of the lack of workers. Whilst the governments of the time cracked down on the survivors, squeezing them for everything they had. A tree will grow stronger after it's pruned, but it will be barren and fruitless for a long time before that happens. Today we might not be facing the horrifying trials that our ancestors faced. We can cure most plagues eventually and we don't need 90% of the population working in the fields to survive. But in many ways the results will be the same. We may not face a crisis of mass death, but we are facing one where those people will never be born in the first place. It's now being predicted over 20 developed nations will see their population. Twenty developed nations will see their populations half before okay, the year. So remember what I said that the again, this is not including advancements in artificial intelligence and dealing with the whole decoupling of labor and capital and the whole blackout in 2054 and all the stuff that I said earlier in my monologue. But here, again, I was saying 2029 is a key date. 2045 is a key point in time and also 2100 is a key point in time. Now here, population is more than, more than 20 countries to have by 2100 okay the earth will be home to 8.8 .8 billion people in 2100 2 billion fewer than current un projections says new study that's not including the blackout 
it's very possible that we go down to uh, 2 billion people in the world if the blackout happens, assuming that there's not decentralized energy that is easy to produce and easy to scale up. Some sort of zero point energy or some sort of electromagnetic, you know, decentralized energy. I, I think it's possible, but the far majority of the people can't even can't even fix their toaster, let alone make a decentralized zero point energy machine. <laughs> I mean, the average person is dumb. But the the uh, there's definitely because of the lack of birth rates and the stress of society and the the indebtedness of this society, the world is not healthy at all. I believe this video talks about an experiment with mice or rats. Hopefully it does. If not, then I'll explain it a little bit. But before I do that, please support my work by going to my website, the-studio-rakevic.com and get the structural nano silver soaps that I have. I have different types. This one is the charcoal tea tree soap. Neutralizes pathogens. It's a very high quality soap. So help support my work and get a few bars of it for your household. I have partnered up with Rainbow Herbals and we've developed these deodorant bars, uh, citrus and also in peppermint tea tree, lavender tea tree, peppermint lavender tea tree deodorant. It's for males and females. And it also can slowly help to detoxify your body. So not only is it is it is not only is it a deodorant, but it'll help to detoxify. It has no aluminum in it and it has no baking soda in it. It's made from essential oils from the Himalayas, very high quality. So please go to the store and get a, a few of these deodorants. You're gonna be happy with your purchase, right? Because these are very high quality. In addition, we have developed a, a utility bar also made from essential oils from the Himalayas. This bar you can apply on your skin every day and your skin will be smoother and, and softer, right? But you can apply it on a wound. It'll help to heal it a little bit quicker or an abrasion or a bug bite. It'll stop the itch of a bug bite. It'll help with a minor burn. So you can use it as a, a skin healing product. So it's, there's a dual purpose here. In addition, if you have a muscle pain, apply it on the muscle area where the pain is. And in about 30 to 60 seconds, the pain is diminished, if not completely alleviated. So please go to the store, the-studio-rakevic.com and get the even better bar. Very high quality. You should have this in your medicine cabinet at home especially if you have kids and they're all constantly outside getting bug bites and all this stuff right and go to my store and get the toothpaste this toothpaste has structural nano silver in it has no fluoride it will this will freshen your breath whiten your teeth neutralize pathogens reduce gingivitis eliminate plaque and with good oral hygiene, you're actually going to improve your cardiovascular system. People don't realize that good oral hygiene is correlated to good heart health, good vascular health. People that have bad oral hygiene, they start having vascular inflammation and they also have valvular disease. Valvular disease is where you get these deposits on the valve of your heart and the heart will function as correctly. So it's good oral hygiene is part of just good cardiovascular health. So please go to my store. This is the best toothpaste you're gonna to be able to get. All that other stuff that's out there is crap, all right? This is the best toothpaste that you can get. So get a few tubes of this. Go to my store, blood-studio-rakevic.com. And by the way, Dr. Paul Cottrell sells a better toothpaste than Alex Jones. So help support Dr. Paul Cottrell. You get 
better information. And you don't get like this. Do you really think that Alex Jones is that healthy? Just look at him. He's younger than I am. He's obviously not following an anti-aging protocol. So go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com. It's the-studio-reykjavik.com. The link is in the description of this video. And get the toothpaste and help support my work. As one hundred, the overall historical effects of this will be the same as with the play. Sure, our grandchildren or even our great-grandchildren might enjoy the benefits. But unluckily for us, we're going to have to deal with the immediate fallout of demographic collapse. It means we'll likely see governors try to squeeze all the work they can out of the people to deal with the scarcity. Facing a shrinking working age population pretty imminently. So I think that's something that we need to be worried about. Um, you know, our working age population has been stagnant for a while. First this is where I think that the industries are going to say, oh, we can't, we have an aging population. We need to implement AI to fill the workforce. And it sets in motion the decoupling of labor and capital. And then the sp downward spiral that leads to a division between the, the transhumanists and the humanists and the blackout in 2054 that I'm predicting. Persistently and precipitously since 2007, and I don't see any reason to think they're going to turn around. Corporations and governments will push for Korean style working conditions and hours if they think they can get away with this. Something huge amounts of the population will have to fight back against to prevent it. All of these awful practices are relics of a bygone system that's fallen apart in South Korea. Back in the economic boom a few decades ago, there was an unwritten contract between workers and the company that employed them. If they gave it their all and were loyal to the company, they'd be guaranteed a decent wage, benefits, and enough to support their families. Today, this isn't true. The contract has been broken by firings and extreme expectations. Today's young Koreans jump from job to job just like the rest of the world has been forced to. But the other side of it, the overworking and the pressure still remains, just without any of the benefits. And doesn't that sound all too familiar to what the West is starting to deal with? With how work culture has been progressing in the West over the past few decades, we're getting closer and closer to a South Korean model. As the same problem of low fertility rates hits our society, the labor pool will only decrease. It will put exactly the same pressures on companies which will turn the screws even more on their own employees. All of this decimates the fertility rates. People just can't afford to have children under these conditions. They can't. We are going to go over common pieces of career advice that job seekers get and separate the myths from the truths. To have children under these conditions, they can't afford the time as people are giving all of their time to work instead, leaving nothing for themselves or for having children. And in developed countries today, women have nearly the same expectation to get into the rat race as men. It's the same in South Korea, which has seen multiple movements pushing for equality in the workplace. And whilst there's obviously a change that needed to take place, it's had some devastating consequences. Salaries changed over time, until today where two incomes are required for buying a house or building a family. Now that women are expected to hold down a job as well, there's nobody left to bring up the kids. While they gain the ability to work, most women lost the choice to stay at home as well, as it's just not economically viable anymore. Then there's the actual financial cost, which with Korea's education system is even more expensive than the rest of the world. Whole classes now can't responsibly have children without putting their financial safety in jeopardy. But potentially the most important factor is that people just don't want to bring children into a society like this. Even if they could afford it, as things are now, they'd be dooming their child to a lifetime of hard work for little to no benefit. An awful side effect of this is that as these middle-aged adults enter retirement, they will have been robbed of the kids they need to take care of them. It also has massive effects on young people, changing their behavior to the detriment of wider society. As the Asian population increases, it sucks young people out of the countryside and into the massive mega cities. In search of freedom, a high paying job, or just because all of their friends have already left, young people around the world have let an exodus out of the countryside and into the cities. It's a problem that gets worse and worse over time. As the villages and towns get older and older, there isn't any reason to keep up the infrastructure or facilities that young people need. What's the point of keeping a school or a college open if there aren't any young people left? Eventually, as the last people left begin to die off or move away, the towns are left as depopulated ruins. While this is happening both in the West and in Asia, it's most prominent in China. Hoto Wan is just one of the many cases of ghost towns and villages in China. Perched atop misty cliffs overlooking a stormy sea is a ghost town that's been overrun by nature. This is Hutuan. 
a once bustling fishing village on an island off the east coast of China. This fishing village on a small island four hours away from Shanghai used to have a healthy population of around 3,000 people. The migration to the city combined with an aging population has led to it being completely deserted. Today, it's a tourist attraction where people can go to see the overgrown houses and abandoned furniture. Photo One's face is the same as thousands of other towns in China and across the world. Population collapse is going to have massive effects on both cities and rural towns and villages, but not in the same way. Ironically, in the larger cities, the problem becomes overpopulation rather than underpopulation. As the country struggles under the weight of its elderly, the economy shrinks. Inflation and the cost of living go up, whilst pay in rural parts of the country either stay the same or go down. More and more young people are left looking for high-paying work to support themselves, with their only option being to move into the city. We can expect to see rents go up, pollution get worse, and cities to get more crowded. On the other side of the spectrum, the massive wave of people leaving the countryside only worsens the crisis. It's not just the lack of young people to begin with. They're all forced to leave their homes looking for work and opportunities. As this happens, the effects only get worse as rural communities shrink into nothing. The last people too old or stubborn to move away slowly die off, leaving whole towns and villages abandoned as we've already seen. After they're gone, they leave abandoned homes. But because of the lack of opportunities, barely anyone young wants to live there. In China today, there are currently 65 million empty homes, despite the fact that housing prices have risen over the past decade. The increase in urban property prices and rents more than accounts for the drop in rural prices. Rural areas do have higher fertility and birth rates on average, which you'd hope might make up for this, but in practice it barely puts a dent on the internal migration of young people into the cities. This isn't the only way in which China can be seen as a warning and a glimpse into our future. One of the most obvious paths to figuring out what's going so wrong is to just look at how marriages and children come into the world to begin with. If we want to see into the West's future, we need to look again to China and their terminal marriage issues. China's been having massive population issues for decades now, but 50 years ago, they had the exact opposite issue. Their population was growing so fast that the communist government doubted whether they'd be able to keep up at all. It's why they implemented the infamous one-child policy barring couples from having more than one child except in special circumstances. While it did have the intended effect of curbing China's explosive growth, it also had some unintended side effects that are playing havoc on China today. One of these is the brutal ratio between young men and women in China. There are now 35 million more men than women in China, making the whole dating and marriage scene far more competitive. This isn't the only problem. In comparison to Western democracies, China and other countries in Asia have sped by their cultural developments. They've gone from highly stratified traditional society straight to the present day of Tinder and Hinge in just a few decades. Meanwhile, the West has had decades of relative freedom for people to choose their own partners before they got exposed to the apps. In China, men are still seen as being the provider. They're expected to have a car and a house and a high-paying job to offer a potential bride. Meanwhile, women are expected to get married young and stay in that marriage for the rest of their lives. It all runs completely counter to the modern world of dating. This tension has only accelerated the same issues that we see in the Western world. The traditional structure of arranged marriages that China's had for thousands of years is now fading away. And so, what's it being replaced with? We know that swiping through dating apps and commodifying love into a data system alienates whole scores of men and women. It's just not a great system for building long-lasting relationships with people, as it dehumanizes everyone on a virtual meat market. It's one of the reasons that China's marriage rate has plummeted over the past 20 years. From 2003 to 2022, the amount of marriages dropped by around half in China from 30.5 billion to... The former president is a threat to our most fundamental freedoms. He has openly said he is proud that he appointed three Supreme Court half in China from 13.5 billion to 6.8. Most of the same pressures that we saw. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I, I, I do like the, the concept of synchronicity and just kind of like a, a random kind of thing that may happen here. But we're talking about population reduction and how that is related to the fracturing of the family unit, which I've been saying for a while now. But then Harris doing a campaign ad that pops up on YouTube is saying, we don't like Trump because he put conservative judges in the Supreme Court because she's upset that she can't have drive-through abortions at McDonald's. We need to start respecting the unborn and their constitutional freedoms. The same reason why there's constitutional freedoms for women should be the same reason why there's constitutional freedoms for the unborn. 
Now, you know, there is some middle ground, right? The ultra right wants no abortion and the ultra left wants abortion even after birth, <laughs> right? Um, but the middle ground is, you know, some sort of, you know, after the first trimester or whatever. But the thing here is, is that the, the big point is liberal policy has detriment, has is huge, has created a, a huge detriment to society. And now this whole video is talking about this, this population reduction. Keep in mind that if you don't have some sort of mindfulness or some sort of spirituality, you're going to lose your way in morality. If you don't have a foundation in the idea of, of family, you're going to lose the fab, lose the brick, the foundation of society. If you lose respect for your country, you're going to lose that social cohesion for a productive society. And why I'm voting for Republican is that I feel that the Democratic Party is anti-God, anti-government, and anti-family. Working hours and low pay for young people means that millions just don't have the time or the money to start a family. The expectation for men to have a whole life ready and waiting is also a problem. If they just can't earn enough money to build this, then it puts them at a big disadvantage in China's materialistic dating culture. This culture of marrying for money, status, and because your family thinks it would be a good match is only going to make things worse for China over the next few decades. Despite the CCP's attempts to curb arranged marriages, the practice still has strong roots in Chinese culture, and it's not just going to disappear because Xi Jinping wants it to. And because of all the things we've already spoken about, young people are struggling to properly connect with each other on their own and build the kinds of relationships that their parents want. It's something that's best shown with an example. If you took a walk through central Shanghai and came across the People's Park, you'd see a strange sight. The walls, the lampposts, and pretty much every other surface in arms reach are covered in advertisements. And they're not selling products or services. Instead, all of the leaflets are advertising people instead. Known as the Shanghai Marriage Market, thousands of parents from across the city come to the market to try and find suitors for their unmarried children. But instead of pictures or messages from the kids, the adverts list their education, their job titles, their height, and their age. Often the people being advertised in the park have no idea their names are even up there. And there are marriage markets like this all across China, where exactly the same thing is happening. But while they might be heading towards extinction, it's probably not for the reason you think. The market has existed for decades now. It's not anything new. But what is troubling for China is how it's going to evolve over the next 10 years or so. Online dating is a rising force in China, slowly replacing the marriage market and other more analog methods. With over $5 billion getting funneled into the new industry in 2022, it's a massively growing sector. The government, hoping that will give their birth rates a little boost, have been uncharacteristically relaxed about their spread. As a result, new apps have sprung up everywhere, offering every single kind of matchmaking service you can think of. But the most successful ones don't cater to finding love or picking up the right person from a crowd. Instead, they're focused on exactly the same things the Shanghai marriage market was focused on status and wealth. One popular app called HIMMR is heavily based on the level of education that the user has achieved. Instead of your pictures or your hobbies, it's this detail that's front and center on your profile. If you graduated with honors from a top school, you're going to find a lot of success. If not, you'll get a bunch of rejections. Some apps even gatekeep the people who are allowed to sign up, only letting in top graduates from the most prestigious schools. Other apps invite the parents to take a role, digitizing the marriage market as faithfully as possible. As we've seen in the West, these apps heighten and exaggerate the qualities that people usually look for in a partner. They open up the playing field to potentially millions of people, forcing their users into a global competition. The illusion of having so much choice artificially raises people's standards. Because of their embedded culture of arranged marriages and marrying for status, China is much farther ahead compared to the West, but we're already catching up. 
We're going to see a huge rise in people explicitly dating for wealth and status. Pretty soon, just like in China today, people won't even bother to pretend they're looking for anything else. Ironically, this is going to happen in large part because of the population crisis. The economic consequences we're going to face as a result are going to squeeze even more people out of a good standard of living. It's interesting because I've seen this over at the Harvard Club during the galas that we have for the, the seasonal galas. What will happen is, is this new crowd of of um, members, the, normally the gala you can you know bring a guest or whatever. So these females that are going to the gala, they they turn it into like some sort of prom kind of thing. It's crazy, but um, these galas uh, they bring their friends, and you can see that the friends are talking to different Harvard members. You know. Right, so their friends are talking to, let's say, males that are that are uh, in the, you know, at the gala, and you can see that they're scoping for some sort of hubby, right? And uh, and it's it's, I, this guy's right. It's in American society today. You're starting to see people going to events that increases their chances. Uh, bumping into someone that is successful and, uh, you know, marrying accordingly to that success. Uh, so I would agree what this docu documentary is kind of moving towards is that American society is going to turn more aristocratic. There's a, there's an aristocratic aspect to it that, that, that is starting to emerge. Up, the competition to climb the ladder will get even harder. You can see why millions could turn to dating and finding a well off partner to get ahead. To understand just what an aging population can do to a country's economy, we only need to visit the last stop on our tour, Japan. Whilst China and Korea were locked in civil wars, struggling to stay afloat, an influx of Western aid combined with a fast growing population after the Second World War turned them into a rising power decades before people thought it would be possible. By the 70s, people were saying that Japan was going to be the next world superpower. People were driving Japanese cars and using Japanese technology. Their strong economy exporting high quality goods around the world. You're going to have to get used to asking questions that might make you a little bit uncomfortable. Philosophy is predicated on the idea. Exporting high quality goods around the world seemed unbeatable. It was in the 80s that the country surpassed the US, Germany, and other large, very developed nations in its GNP per capita. Today, it's a completely different story. One in every seven kids in Japan lives in poverty. People work excruciatingly long hours just to survive, and the economy has been stagnating for decades, with still no end in sight. The yen is dropping, and when the bubble burst in the early 1990s, the recession it caused is still arguably ongoing today, as the country never really recovered. At first, people blamed things like reckless money lending or other single economic factors, but their inability to recover has shown is a far more insidious long-term problem. A population crash. We know from our own experience what this economic stagnation looks like. We've been going through it for the past decade and a half. Japan has been dealing with it for more than twice that long. Depopulation has decimated the countryside, and meanwhile the cities have become more crowded and denser than ever. So what have the effects been on their culture and their people? Large parts of Japanese society, millions of men and women, have entirely detached themselves from it. First, there are the hikikomori, around one and a half million people living in almost complete isolation. Secluded in their bedrooms, they live completely solitary lives, getting their only interaction from escapism and the internet. It's a problem that's been going on for decades, and despite attempts to solve it and draw these people out, more people isolate themselves every day. Current estimates predict that Japan could see over 10 million of its citizens becoming like this in the future. Even among the people who still venture into the outside world, it isn't much better. Millions of young men and women are forgoing relationships and family, instead focusing on their careers for escapism. Nearly half of all young Japanese adults today are virgins, whilst millions of others have lost all hope for their society to get better. The economic stagnation and the awful conditions are part of the reason for this, but a less measurable but more important factor is how meaning has been stripped from people's lives. Finding a partner, building a family, the bedrocks of civilization, has now been packaged into a product in Japan. They are at the forefront of offering alternatives to real human connection. First, there are the hosts and hostess bars, where you can pay to have someone pretend to connect with you. Or, there are the cuddle cafes, which offer a sterile kind of alternative to physical connection. 
You can always pay for something more than just cuddles, of course. That's widespread as well. But then there's all the digital media, every kind of fantasy you can imagine. And lots you couldn't even dream of are all right there for sale. Now, none of this is unique to Japanese culture in particular. It's got nothing to do with that. Instead, the explanation for why this has happened can be found in a set of sociological experiments conducted all the way back in the 1960s. This, this, this YouTuber is, what's about this mentioned. This is the rat experiment or the mouse experiment that I was talking about. So this is in, this is important to really pay attention to because the behavior of these rodents we're seeing in the behavior of humans in these urban centers like New York or Tokyo or you know, even dense, dense populations in Europe, right? Now, before we do that, I also saw a documentary on Clinton. Now you would say, you know, how is population reduction related to, to Clinton? What was going on economically as he moved into office gave a hint of where this was going, but it was circumvented because of technology. Now we burned through that the benefits of technology, the, the digital age or the computer age, right? Now there's this new thing, this AI age, um, that may help us, may hurt us, who knows? I think it's more dystopic than utopic um, if we don't put guardrails on it. So I may be playing that video if I can find it because what was going on economically around the world was hinting that we would be where we're at today. But let's play the, the rolling study here. You can even dream of all right there for sale. Now, none of this is unique to Japanese culture in particular. It's got nothing to do with that. Instead, the explanation for why this has happened can be found in a set of sociological experiments conducted all the way back in the 1960s. YouTuber Wasibok has mentioned this before. The mouse utopia experiments were a set of multiple studies on rodent behavior all carried out by a scientist called John B. Cowan. The setup was relatively simple. John constructed a set of enclosures and living spaces for mice designed to meet their every need. There was unlimited food, space for thousands of rats, and a whole world of different rooms and chambers for them to claim as their own. John expected the rats to breed as much as they could, quickly filling out the enclosure to capacity. Instead, he saw much more disturbing and strange results, which were almost the same every time he repeated the experiments. The population of the rats would never go over a third of the capacity of the enclosure, and after a few generations, it would start to fall again until all of the rats eventually died out, and it was because of their behavior. He noticed that there were different types of rats which emerged. Some of the male rats became dominant and violent, taking charge of small territories within the enclosure and monopolizing breeding rights for the female rats. Some male rats became submissive and weak. They stopped breeding altogether with the females while seeking out the dominant males for contact. Others withdrew from social contact completely. As the experiments would go on, the behavioral quirks would turn into pathologies. There was more fighting, and the female rats eventually stopped building nests or rearing their young. After a few hundred days, the colony would start losing its population and collapse because the remaining rats would become too deranged to raise their children. At this point, you're probably starting to notice some similarities between the rats and our society today. Whilst our behavior can't be completely explained by animals, it does shine a light onto the dangers that we face with population collapse. Perhaps much more pressing than the economic hardship or the changes to work are these behavioral pathologies. All of these modern part of that video is so important. I mean, a lot of this video is important to digest. I'm going to replay it, but a third of the population, it reaches a third of the population, and then there's these aggressive behaviors that take place, even though they could have enough space, to the point where the aggressive ones get the breeding rights, the aggressive males get the breeding rights, and then over time, the offspring end up also becoming aggressive and the population starts to go down because the parents aren't taking care of the offspring. So you, you, you do see this kind of thing that's going on in New York where there's a aggressive, you know, we could probably have more space and, and lower, you know, lower costs for, for housing, you know, so we need more 
we need more buildings from commercial to residential, you know, for it to be more affordable. But in terms of, there's enough cold space for people to live. But there's a lot of aggressive behavior, especially in dense areas that you see on the MTA, you know, the, the mass transit system, or um, on the street corners. There's there there's these these there's these behaviors and pathologies that are not conducive to a well productive society. And so these stresses of population, of too much, of too much of a population, and the stresses of food, of, of, um, of resources, ends up creating this more spiraling effect. Now, think about what I was saying in 2054, where you see the, the, the effects of the years of decoupling of labor and capital, the transhumanists trying to have dominance. And then you have the monks or the humanists that realize that they have to do the blackout to try to kill off the transhumanists, even though that their population is gonna go down. There's kind of like this, it's almost like a moral dilemma. To save humanity, you have to kill off 7% of humanity. It's a difficult choice, but it's very possible that is what needs to be discussed in 2054 if transhumanists are gaining power, gaining dominance. And so you have these populations that are stressed out because as we move towards 2054, you're not gonna see probably people moving away from cities, but probably more people are moving into cities because of, of um, job prospects are probably better at the, in, the, in the population density areas versus agricultural areas or even the suburbs. So there's still gonna be this movement towards the cities in the United States and that adds more stress. And as the decoupling of labor and capital happen, it just spirals down. They have to work more, they have to struggle more, and you, you're starting to see the signs of it already. And so these behaviors that we're seeing in society that happen to be democratic run cities, you know, through either the, through the state at the state level or even at the mayoral level um they're they're spiraling out of control there's lawlessness and lack of lack of regard to to property you're seeing these these aggressive behaviors taking place so if we may be hardwired for the situation this may actually if we are pushed to a corner this study may actually kind of give credence to this idea that the humanists are going to have to push the button, cut the cord or whatever, whatever, however phrase you want to use to actually save humanity by by having their actions to try to kill off transhumanism, but in the process affects 70% of the population where there's a big die off. Now, if you wanna be philosophical about this, and you know, the, the question is, should hu the human race, should humanism survive? I would say yes. If human existence, if humanism is, is at the edge of extinction because of transhumanism, then that action that might need to take place in 2054 is appropriate, even though it may kill off 70% of, of the world's population. Because in the end, we, the human, humanism, the human race can still continue instead of going extinct through transhumanism.
So it's it's a you know it's a difficult situation. You know? Now let, let me replay let me replay that simulability analysis experiment because I, I find that I find that extremely interesting what's going on with society. Something more than just cuddles, of course. That's widespread as well. But then there's all the digital media, every kind of fantasy you can imagine. And lots you couldn't even dream of are all right there for sale. Now, none of this is unique to Japanese culture in particular. It's got nothing to do with that. Instead, the explanation for why this has happened can be found in a set of sociological experiments conducted all the way back in the 1960s. YouTuber Wasibok has mentioned this before. The Mouse Utopia experiments were a set of multiple studies on rodent behavior, all carried out by a scientist called John B. Cowan. The setup was relatively simple. John constructed a set of enclosures and living spaces for mice designed to meet their every need. There was unlimited food, space for thousands of rats, and a whole world of different rooms and chambers for them to claim as their own. John expected the rats plenty to be as food, much as they could. Plenty of food, plenty of space. But there were pathologies that started to emerge that were aggressive. Quickly filling out the enclosure to capacity. Instead, he saw much more disturbing and strange results, which were almost the same every time he repeated the experiments. The population of the rats would never go over a third of the capacity of the enclosure, and after a few generations, it would start to fall again until so all of the rats eventually died out. And it was because of their behavior. He noticed that there were different types of rats which emerged. Some of the male rats became dominant and violent. So, the, the space that an animal needs to live. All right, logically, is if you're calculating the amount of space that a human can live, the actual amount of space that you really need to prevent aggressive behavior is even more than that. And so when population densities start to increase in cities like New York, it's increasing the probability of aggressive behavior because the city isn't growing. The space of the city isn't growing. That's fixed. What's happening is, is that the people coming into the city, that population is growing. So the amount of the amount of space relative to the amount of people that are in New York or in these high population density areas are that the space is just too small relative to the, the, to the size, even though mathematically there's enough people that actually live in, you know, 500 square feet or whatever. But I think the point here is, is that just because you can physically live that way doesn't mean that psychologically it's healthy. And I think this is part of the reason why that as cities reached a certain point with the coupling of uh, the automobile, people moved out of the city and moved into the suburbs. And you've talked to people that are in the suburbs versus the city. And they, they have different stresses. They have different physique and they have different mannerisms and they're there is, there is, there's a, there's a, I, maybe I'm a little bit um, idealistic about this, but it seems to me that the suburbs are less stressful than the inner cities in general. Now, some suburbs are bad areas and there's lots of crime and there's stress, but in non-crime ridden suburbs, you're going to see less stress compared to the inner city because in the inner city you're going to have you know especially like new york there are dumps there are places that are really bad in new york there are places that are very posh but it's in such a small area so whatever the population of the of the of the organism is whatever space is out there, their max population before they become aggressive, at least for rodents, is one third of the space available. So you need much more space to actually not have all these different pathologies. 
And I think this is also proven by as as we became more domesticated and we weren't hunting and gathering, our population started to grow more and we started to live in villages and it started to grow. And then you started to see psychological problems arise in society. So that kind of plays into what, you know, in, in urban settings, there's more psychological problems. So when there's a big push for the 15 minute city, then you're talking about seeing much more psychological pathologies to arise. There's gonna be more people with mental illness. Scary. Taking charge of small territories within the enclosure and monopolizing breeding rights for the female rats. Some male rats became submissive and weak. They stopped breeding altogether with the females while seeking out the dominant males for contacts. Others withdrew from social contact completely. As the experiments would go on, the behavioral quirks would turn into pathologies. There was more fighting, and the female rats eventually stopped building nests or rearing their young. After a few hundred days, the colony would start losing its population and collapse because the remaining rats would become too deranged to raise their children. At this point, you're probably starting to notice some similarities between the rats and our society today. Whilst our behavior can't be completely explained by animals, it does shine a light onto the dangers that we face when population collapse. Perhaps much more pressing than the economic hardship or the changes to work are these behavioral pathologies. All of these modern problems are decimating the ability and the motivation for people to create a family. And despite how much we deny it, a strong and healthy family is the bedrock and the overall purpose the society should have. Our modern society's failure to provide this will be seen in history as its great failure. If you enjoyed this video and you want to learn how to make videos like I do on this channel, well, I'll show you behind the scenes stuff. All right. So I thought that was interesting. It's very important to understand the population decline and the stresses that are involved. I think this rodent experiment explains some behaviors that we're starting to see in urban settings and why there may be a collapse of the family unit. Of course, there's some political policies that are in place that helps that along, that, that promulgates the, the destruction of the family. But there's also population densities relative to, this, to the space that they're living in. And that what is interesting is, is that you need much more space than what logically you would think that you would need to have a healthy, See, I think that the big takeaway here is, is that to have healthy populations, mentally healthy populations, you need more space. It doesn't, I'm just intuitively, it doesn't seem, seem right to, for humans to be constantly in a high density environment, day in and day out. And that it, you kind of need to kind of like have more space. And, and that might be because, uh, you know, the way we've developed during hunting and gathering eras, you know, we need to see farther. We need to see a tree line or we need to see the horizon. When everything's so close and condensed, it doesn't seem healthy, right? Or when you go to, let's say in an event, let's say, baseball game where there's lots of people at a, let's say a major league baseball game there's lots of people or a football game there's lots of people there is um you don't have that much space and so that and aggressive behavior may come out of the crowd at a at a faster rate and they're more or may be more prevalent because of this population density so even in a short term you might actually exhibit these behaviors. So hopefully you learn something that there is this problem with the population decline in the world, that this is not monotonic and it'll just keep on growing and growing and growing. And that there's this new feature 
that's artificial intelligence. And part of that is going to cause more stress because of the decoupling of labor and capital. But there's going to be advancements as we move towards 2045 where people can benefit and live longer lives. Now, maybe people may say, well, if it's going to be dystopic, they don't want to live longer. Okay, I, I could you know understand that, that argument. Um, but there is this kind of like parallel thing that's going on. Population density, population, populations are going to go down, but there's going to be AI that can, if people want to use it, will be able to live longer lives. So that decline will be reduced. And there is this increasing stress between the transhumanists and the humanists which i think will lead to a blackout in 2054 i'll go into more detail on why i say that but but there will be a energy blackout to try to kill off transhumanists and there's going to be this war and there's going to be a huge population reduction in that because of killing off the power and also the war, the war between the transhumanists and the so that's my take on it. Please go to my store, the-studio-rapevic.com and help support my work and help to support your health. You can do that by taking the structural nano silver gel that I have. I have two types. I have it in the tube here and I also have it in a dispenser. The, this structural nano silver gel is a skincare. So you can apply it on your skin right before you go to bed exfoliate in the morning and you'll notice that your skin is clearer and tighter, especially around your face. In addition, you can use it on wounds. It'll help to heal a wound or an abrasion or a minor burn. It'll speed the time for, for healing. And it'll neutralize pathogen, pathogens. So you can put it on your hands, you can put it around your mouth or around your nose, around your ears, around your eyes, lightly coat your nostril and you that will stay active for about five hours to prevent um, pathogens so it'll neutralize the pathogens so please go to my store the-studio-rickfit.com and get the structural nano silver gel it's a dual product it helps with the skin and it helps neutralize pathogens so thank you for listening and i will do another video uh on clinton and try to that the economic conditions as he was coming into office kind of hinted at where we're at today. What saved him was the unexpected productivity from computerization. So stay tuned for that video. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.